I'd like to say, first of all, how happy I am to be here and how impressed I am that you are willing to come and listen to me instead of watching the figure skating championships on, <laughs> on, and the Olympics tonight. But um, I'm really pleased to be here, especially with um, at Stanford, where there are so many people who are doing such important work on looking at inequity or inequalities in opportunities in this country. And so this has been the issue that I've been really interested in and really trying to look at the role of child care and pre-K programs as a, as a means for possibly reducing gap of race and poverty gaps. So what I'm going to try to do is cover three topics and then I'd really like to leave a lot of time, hopefully, for um, a conversation with you about these issues. Um, I'd like to talk about child care as a promising social policy. It is one that's getting a lot of attention, starting with Obama, but also in many states as a means to try to address issues having to do with um, um, academic gaps in achievement. I'm going to talk about the evaluation of public, publicly funded programs as a, a means to try to look at how well these programs are working and achieving this goal, and then the challenges in using child care to reduce gaps. Um, so first of all, I, I don't think I have to really tell you this, but it's clear that early experiences are very important. And it's becoming, this is something that now is getting a lot of policy attention. Early experiences play a cru cr crucial role in the development of academic and social skills. It's very clear that the experiences that children have in the first five years of life are related to the development of their language, reading, math, social, and social direct um, trajectories through school and well into adulthood. Um, it's also clear that early experiences are very important for brain development, which is, of course, related to the development of behavior trajectories, but that early experiences have been shown to be related to the, the development of the, um, pre um, the prefrontal cortex and, <coughs> and also to put things like the um, um, oh, I'm sorry, amygdala. I can't ever say that word. But anyway, and then it's also clear that early experiences can be used to shape genes in terms of an epigenetic approach so that there's some evidence that the kinds of early experiences you have change the regulation of the genes, which then can shape cognitive and social development. So early experiences are clearly really, really important. So what do we know about what helps shape early experiences? Well, whether it's with parents or in child care, it's clear that the quality of early experiences are related to things like warm, responsive interactions with caregivers. All young children need, need to have warm or need to be able to form an attachment relationship. They need to be able to have somebody in their environment that they feel confident will be there for them in order to, do, to um, show optimal cognitive and social development. Another aspect of early experiences that are, de that are related to later development as well as early development is the access to age-appropriate activities so that it's children acquire academic and language skills and social skills when they're allowed to explore their environment and have the opportunity to play with lots of different age appropriate activities. Um, the thing, a, a characteristic that's really important for early development is frequent extended conversations with caregivers where it's clear that children, especially in terms of language development, acquire language skills through conversations with peers, but especially with adults. And especially when those conversations involve multiple exchanges between the child and the caregiver. And especially when the caregiver is clearly enjoying the child and setting up the kind of interaction where the child and the caregiver are 
are having fun together and the caregiver is scaffolding the interactions so that the child is both having fun and learning from these kinds of experiences. And then something that's being, um, that's coming out more and more in, is that the content of what is being taught, especially in childcare, especially in pre-K, probably really makes a difference. So that there's growing evidence that the kinds of curricula in preschool can be related to early development, where curricula that are focused and intensive and hierarchical, that, for example, Doug Clement's Building Blocks curricula, which is done both in large group but especially in small group. But what it does is, it's based on the idea that first you have to learn how to count and then you have to learn cardinality. You have to understand that when you're stopping to count and you've counted three things, that that means you, that the number three represents how many objects you have. And then that skill is related to the next set of skills which might be the basis for addition. But that all of these skills are hierarchical and that you have to be sure that you're exposing these child, the, the child to these skills in an order so that they can really build off of what they already know. Um, so this is something that's starting to get more attention. Ideally, it's done in a way where the child's in small group activities and involves opportunities to play with objects as well as, as just listen to the caregiver. But greater attention on the content of what's being covered in child care is now a dimension of quality for child care. Um, so child care has been viewed as a means to address, um, to try to provide children who otherwise may not have comparable levels of skills. So compensatory child care, child care has become a, a policy issue in this country and actually in many, many places in the, in the world where based on the idea that early skills provide the foundation for cognitive, academic, and social development, which is fairly well documented and demonstrated both in this country and elsewhere, and that there are poverty differences in the acquisition of cognitive skills during early childhood, leading to gaps in, in achievement related skills at entry to school that are linked to poverty and linked to race. These gaps emerge as early as a first year of life and continue throughout early childhood. They can oftentimes continue to grow throughout early childhood. And they've been linked to differences in stimulation, such as differences in the level of conversations and the kind of information that the child is being exposed to in their environment. So the idea is because these gaps ex clear are, have emerged and they've been linked to the kinds of things that child care tries to focus on, child care can provide a means to try to address these gaps. Um, and there have been lots of, of research around this topic with, that many of you in the room have participated in. Um, many of it showing positive impacts of child care programs for low-income children. The ones I'm going to try to talk to you about today focused on rigorous designs uh, with the gold standard being the randomized clinical trial so that who got the treatment and who got the control was determined solely by chance. Um, that's not always possible. In fact, it's usually not possible. And so there are econometric methods and designs that provide rigorous, although not quite as rigorous, designs for addressing these kinds of questions, such as regression discontinuity designs and fixed effects designs. So the, the studies that I'm going to focus on today have one of these three kinds of designs. <clears throat> it, well, and propensity score analysis, which is another um, econometric approach. The, the programs I'm going to talk about are early intervention programs, pre-kindergarten and Head Start evaluations, and then evaluations of curricula, practices, and professional development. Um, so the first set of research that was conducted in this area was conducted beginning actually in 1960, from 1960 to 1975, 
early intervention studies funded by NICHD to look at the extent to which either programs focused on parenting or programs focused on child care could make a difference for low income, uh, low income children. There were 10 studies funded by NICHD. Two of these, the Perry Preschool High Scope Study and the Abbasidarian Study, have followed the children into adulthood and had the most rigorous designs. Perry Preschool involved 123 three to four year old children. They were recruited because at age three to four when recruited, they were already showing low IQs and they came from poor families. They were provided part-time preschool, child, early care and education, and home visiting. The curriculum focused on active participa participatory learning. And these, child these children have now been followed through the age of 40, <coughs> where the, the evaluation has demonstrated that they, the treated individuals have more education, more income, lower rates of, of criminal behavior, welfare use, and higher rates of employment, lower rates of unemployment. And a cost-benefit analysis conducted by Heckman's group out of the University of Chicago suggested an annual return of 7 to 10% or um, $12.50 for every dollar spent. So this is an example, a relatively small study, but it, and a study that gets widely cited in this area as demonstrating long-term returns for high-quality child care as a means for addressing achievement gaps. The Abbasidarian project was from about the same time. It was conducted in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. 111 infants were recruited either prenatally or right around birth, with the oldest child being recruited at four months. They were given child care starting as young as six weeks through the time that they went to kindergarten. This was full-time, full-day child care for five years, and then they've been followed through 30 years of age. And the results from this study have, have yielded higher IQs for the treated children with an effect size of 0.25, academic skill, higher academic skills on reading and math, and higher levels of educational achievement in terms of number of years and proportion that graduated from college with an odds ratio of 4.6 in terms of graduation from college. They were, less, they were more likely to be employed. And then uh, uh, a study about five years ago did a health assessment of these individuals and found lower levels of blood pressure and lower levels of obesity, at least among the boys. And a cost-benefit analysis of this study through 15 years of age suggested a return of $2.5 for every dollar spent. This was the first study that I worked on when I was a graduate student. And um, so I've, I've been much, I have a lot more access to the data. So I wanted to show you some of the results. So in terms of math scores, Starting at eight years of age through 21 years, you can see that the treated children in blue are outscoring the controlled children, although unfortunately we do see a tendency for everybody to go down, which is not surprising given um, the income of the parents. Um, for reading scores, we again see fairly large differences with the treated children scoring higher than the controlled children. And a lot more stability in, uh, in reading scores across time for the treating group and for the control group. And this was a time in Chapel Hill when, when these children were going through school that high stakes testing was just starting to get introduced and there was a great deal of focus on reading. So I think what we're seeing is not only an impact of the Abbasidarian project, in terms of the difference, but hopefully an impact of school in a non-experimental way reflected in these slides. Okay, so in terms of getting back to those original 10 studies, there was a follow-up that was conducted by Lazar and Darlington um, where they tried to follow up all of the participants in those original 10 NICHD studies and collect and doing a meta-analysis across all 10 studies 
they found that the treated children were more likely to finish high school, less likely to um, receive special ed, and less likely to be retained. So this, this body of evidence provided the first set of evidence really suggesting that childcare can make a big difference for children from these low-income families. Are you okay with questions? Oh, me? sure, absolutely. Do you have thoughts on why Perry showed impact on criminal behavior <coughs> and the others didn't? I have a couple of, these are totally my opinion, not based on evidence. I think there are two things. I think one is Detroit is a very different place from Chapel Hill, and I think it's much easier to get into trouble in if you're growing up in Detroit at the, at the time that the Perry kids were. So the opportunity was probably harder. Um, I also think that the focus was really different between the two projects. So Abbasidarian, the focus really was to improve language skills with the idea and to try to really focus on cognitive skills. In Perry, I think there was, it was much more of a child-directed kind of participatory, you know, there wasn't as much focus on academics per se and language per se, and so there might have been, in contrast, more focus on social skills, although, you know, I, well, Anyway, there's a long story there that I won't I won't go into, but um, it's clear for Abbasidarian we do not have an impact on social on, on on things like delinquency. And most of the cost benefit difference between Abbasidarian and Perry is actually the criminal exactly. behavior differences. You know, and so in Abbasidarian, the cost benefit analysis is based on anticipated earnings based on higher educational skills. Whereas in Perry, most of the cost benefit came out of preventing jail and per, you know reducing rates of, of of welfare. Okay, so what was really interesting to me, kind of when I reflect back over my many many years of being in in this field, is why these two studies have become so influential in our discussion about the impact of childcare. And I think, first of all, they're, they're very rigorous. And, you know, they have a rigorous design. There was random assignment. They were experimental studies. And they've been used to do things like justify Head Start. Under the Reagan administ administration, they wanted to devolve Head Start to the states. And the results from these studies were largely used to prevent that from happening. Um, they've been used to argue for state-based programs such as pre-K programs, quality rating and improvement systems. And um, I think that, sorry, the reason that they're so influential is the, the methodological rigor, the appeal of the findings in that we're seeing impact on school age and adult outcomes for an early intervention program for low-income kids, which is something you really want to believe can happen. And then I think the other thing that made a huge difference with these studies is the researchers worked really closely with advocates. And so the word got out not just by the researchers, but by the people in state departments and community action programs, in you know, at NAYC, in the you know, National Association for Education for Young Children. So that this work with advocates made made the message easier to communicate because the advocates didn't need to add all the caveats that researchers feel compelled to add. Probably way oversold them, but it had a, a very positive impact. Okay, so what do we know about Head Start? Head Start in part came out of Perry Preschool and in Abbasidarian. It was started 15 years ago as part of um, the War on Poverty. It's a program that involves local control with national performance standards. In 2012, about a million children and their families were enrolled in Head Start. The, the country invested $8 billion in Head Start in 2012. It's a mixed model 
where it includes um, center care for preschoolers with 88% of the preschoolers being in center care and for as we move into Early Head Start and Early Head Start gets expanded, 58% um, of, the, of the grantees serve infants and toddlers um, in a combination of home visiting and centers with typically providing home visiting in the first one or two years and moving into centers as children get older. In 2012, 62% of the head teachers had a BA with, after a requirement by the agency that said at least 50% of, of the teachers in a grant, uh, at a grantee level had to have a bachelor's degree. 30% of the staff are dual language teachers. Um, Head Start was a very protected program for a very long time. Everybody wanted to do good things for poor kids. And there were some preliminary evaluations that didn't look real good. So there wasn't a whole lot of incentive for the agency <coughs> to evaluate. So finally, in 1998, Congress said you have to do an evaluation. And this resulted in the Head Start Impact Study, which provided a nationally representative sample of Head Start programs with national, with random assignment at the center level of children either to Head Start or to pre-K, or to, sorry, to Head Start or to the control group. So they used a wait list design. Centers that had wait lists were asked to participate. Grantees were randomly selected, and children on the wait list were then randomly assigned. Um, the children have now been followed through to grade three. So what did they find? They found some significant but modest effects at the end of one year of Head Start. And they, they looked at this separately for children who entered as three-year-olds and children who entered as four-year-olds. So basically, they see positive effects on reading and language and literacy skills and a few other things. There was a, in the follow-up, they followed the kids through grade three. Um, none of the early effects maintained through grades one or three. So none of the effects shown on this, this slide were also seen for all across the whole group in grades one or three. There was some evidence of differential effects, some evidence that at grades one or three, there were bigger effects for DLL children, for other, for dual language learning children, and bigger effects for children who entered Head Start with lower cognitive skills. Now, one of the problems that makes this really difficult to interpret, especially for the three-year-old cohort, is the fact that to get cooperation, they had to promise that they would not place any restrictions on the programs as to what happened to the three-year-olds as four-year-olds. So the three-year-olds who were denied services into Head Start because they were in this treatment group could enter Head Start as four-year-olds, and 50% of them did. Only 63% of the three-year-old group had two years of Head Start. So by the time, for the three-year-old cohort, where we see the bigger, slightly bigger effects, by the time we get to kindergarten, there's not much difference in terms of the experiences of the treatment in the control group. Um, there are other studies that have followed up Head Start kids do, using data sets such as the... Um, Wasn't there also a psych problem after that one? Right. So this is, but that you know, that that would that was actually part of. So right. I mean, there there are all kinds of confounds. So one of the this is not a pure study of Head Start versus nothing. Yeah. This was Head Start versus everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe Head Start versus um, a mixture of kids going to Head Start and pre K. Yeah, right, and, and, and in fact, once you look at it really careful, I mean, like everything, life is messy. Yeah. So there was some evidence at the programs that really care, that for the high-risk kids, that these programs really cared about serving. 
and you know they'd always placed a big focus on, high, on serving high risk kids. If those programs had other programs in the same center or in the same grantee, no. So like a lot of a lot of centers have a Head Start classroom, a pre K classroom, and then other classrooms that maybe are in other programs altogether. So it's this mixed model of funding that they 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 pool funding across a lot of different sources and not in it it's not always the case that in a given classroom all the kids are getting funded by the same source now if you do that you have to meet the criteria for whatever your funding sources are for that classroom but there was some evidence that programs for the kids that they were really worried about if they didn't get into the head start classroom they might have gotten into the pre-k classroom in that center so, you know, it's not a pure study. In no way is it a pure study. Um, so, that some of these other studies use national and longitudinal st studies that had followed children up through into young adulthood. And they looked at what, using either family fixed effects or propensity score analyses. Did they see long term effects for Head Start? And, they did. So using a fixed effects approach, looking at, in a family, if you had two children, one child went to Head Start, one child didn't, and you look at their outcomes, say at the end of high school, do you see that the child who went to Head Start did better? And there, there was some evidence of that across a number of studies. And again, and in addition, there were some studies that used a propensity score approach. Um, so these studies suggested that despite the fact that there were not differences on academic tests for these children, that the children who had been to Head Start had higher levels of education, reduction of special education, and lower like, rates of grade retention as well. So these studies suggested there might be long-term effects of Head Start even if there's fade out in the kinds of things that that were evaluated in the follow-up study. Who knows? Did the family fixed effects studies find a difference on whether the non-attending sibling was younger or older? I there I think there was a tendency because I think what tended to happen is a program became available. But I, I I'd have to go back and reread the articles to know for sure. So they're, they're, again, you know, I, I think that they, they tried, because these are being done by economists, they really tried to account for those kinds of things. And I think that they felt confident that that did not explain their findings. Um, and then there's also early Head Start, which is services provided to infants and toddlers and their families. It's often a combination of home visiting and center care. There was an evaluation of, there have been two evaluations of early Head Start. The National Early Head Start <coughs> Evaluation Research Study, um, which looked at the first funded sites, found small but significant effects on children's cognitive and social outcomes at age three that were maintained through early elementary school but disappeared by fifth grade. And then there's Baby Faces, which is a, a survey looking at early Head Start as it exists now, um, looking at the relationship between that and child development. So, you know, when the, the evaluations of Head Start suggest that it has small but significant effects when children are in Head Start, that they're, that the, that the, we're not talking about a world where mother, children stay home with their parents if they don't go to Head Start. So the comparison group is, is, is more difficult. And um, there's, you know, in, you know, small but significant effects seems to be the best thing that you can say about the impact of early of Head Start. So what about pre-K programs? They're the other really big federally funded initiative providing child care services to low-income children. These are state-funded programs, typically with a major focus on academic skills. They're, but these are state-level programs. So states 
vary considerably in terms of what is a pre-K program. They vary in terms of whether the, 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 the programs are open to all children, universal um, programs, or whether they're targeted for children from low-income families or otherwise considered at, at risk. They vary in, term of, in terms of whether they have certified teachers or paraprofessionals. They vary in terms of whether they're located in public schools or not. Um, some are part day, some are full day. S the ratios sometimes are regulated and sometimes are not. Sometimes they're required to have a curriculum, sometimes they're not. So while pre-kindergarten is considered one policy, in fact, it's, it's at least 43 different policies for the 43 different states, and in California, it's even more than that, because you have different pre-K programs in different places. Um, so what do we know about pre-K? So the first pre-K evaluation that gained a lot of attention was the evaluation of Tulsa. This is a universal program. At the time the evaluation was done, it was a mature program with high penetration, and it, the, the program required certified teachers with school wages and benefits. The evaluation was a regression discontinuity design, which compared the young kindergarten children who had had pre-K to the older preschoolers who were entering pre-K. Um, there were over a thousand students involved in the evaluation and they used widely used individually administered standardized tests. So the, the idea behind a, a regression discontinuity design, which I assume because you guys are at Stanford you probably know, but the idea is that something comes along and perturbs this relationship that's going on. So you have a relationship <coughs> between age and child outcome and there's one rule, some, one thing happens that makes this line discontinuity, and there's a discontinuity in it. In this case, it's the fact that on September 1st, children went to kindergarten. And so if you entered the program and had a birthday before September, after September 1st, <laughs> You got a year of pre-K, and then you went to kindergarten. The children who were close to the same age, but whose birthday was before September 1st, couldn't enter the program until the next until the next year. And so, what we're doing is we're comparing the fall scores in the fall that cohort two children entered pre-K with the fall scores in kindergarten for cohort one children who had just left pre-K. And so this takes into account selection in terms of families who will enroll children in pre-K. It is based on a somewhat dubious, but an assumption that the only difference between these kids is the age, and that got them either a year of pre-K or not. So what did they find? Huge effects. So they found big effects on reading, spelling, and smaller effects on math. And they found somewhat different effects depending on the race of the children, with bigger effects for the Hispanic kids in orange, and somewhat smaller effects on average for the white kids. And all the effects here are, 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 are significant at P less of 0.05. So when you compare for in each of these groups, the kids who were just entering pre-K with those who were just entering, who had just left pre-K, this study suggests that good pre-K programs can have really big effects on these kinds of academic skills. Another study that was more recently um, published is the Boston Pre-K. In, in this program, they have certified teachers. It also is a universal program. It's a full day. The big difference between this program and the Tulsa program is the curriculum. So in Tulsa, they used a very global child-centered, or a, you know, participatory curriculum, creative curriculum, or high scope. 
in this program, they decided to to, to supplement the, the more global with a focused reading program and a focused math curriculum. And there was pretty extensive coach training, a, a pre-service training and coaching, or training at the beginning of the year, and then on-site coaching to try to make sure the teachers were implementing this reading and building and, and math curriculum. The evaluation, again, was a regression discontinuity, and again, they had fall assessments on widely used measures, individually administered standardized tests. So what did they find? So they also have very big effects. In this case, they also had measures of executive function as well, and language, as well as reading and math. So they had a broader set of outcomes in the Tulsa study, and they see Big effects overall and larger effects for Asian and Hispanic children and smaller effects for white children. And what is the explanation offered for the ethnic differences? Um, I don't remember, honestly. They, they wanted to test for them. I think that they're I think there's several possible explanations, but um, I, 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 I want to go back to the article rather than put words, words in their mouth. Okay, I think for the Hispanic kids, one of the issues was they began so much farther behind because these are English immersion programs, and their English was very, so the effect sizes were much larger because they started, <coughs> excuse me, they started that, farther that's behind. What I know that's the case, that's what I, I know that's the case for this group. I think the Asian kids were Pakistan. I mean, I think they were also a, a recent immigrant group that, like the Hispanic kids, may have been dual language learners. Because these kids are not starting from the same point. Exactly. And these effect sizes kind of mask that. Exactly. And, you know, so I know, you know, the kids, I'm pretty sure that these are kids that started with very few skills on these measures and showed huge gains. Okay, so, but these are two exemplary programs. What about typical pre-K? And the National Center for Early Development and Learning was funded um, to try to look at this question. So these data were collected in, in the mid-2000s, but um, we selected 11 states that were, had the largest mature programs at the time that also had some penetration. So I think we required that at least 15% of the pre uh, eligible preschool children attended the programs and the programs had been in, in existence for at least five years. We randomly selected programs, <coughs> classroom with, with, classrooms within programs, and children within classrooms. We did fall and spring data collection. And um, what we found was that quality of instruction predicted gains in academic skills, and teacher sensitivity predicted gains in social skills. So here are the 11 states that were involved with the study. So Southern California was part of the study. Um, these are the kinds of, of um, characteristics of the programs on average. But what I want you to pay attention to here is the level of variability that we see. So these programs vary greatly across states, from some states that had really good, really strict criteria in terms of ratio and teacher education, and other states that had virtually none. And so unlike the Tulsa or the um, Boston study, relative, about half of the teachers in these studies had a bachelor's degree. In less than half their full day, most were not, or less, uh, uh, just slightly over half were located in schools. So this is very different than these two exemplary programs that, that I was just talking about. So what do we see here? Again, we see significant but modest effects in the gains that we see from fall to spring. So we see, significant gains, slightly bigger than were observed in Head Start between the treatment and the control group. But in, we see gains on receptive language, expressive language, math, and social skills, and no difference in terms of behavior problems. 
So in summary, I would say there's a great deal of state-to-state -state variability. The best pre-K programs have large effects. The effects are similar to Perry Preschool and Abyssinian. But, um, and there's some evidence from these studies and other studies that the best programs have bigger impacts than Head Start, that um, propensity score analyses were conducted to try to look at the, the relative impact of pre-K versus Head Start in Georgia and Tulsa, and these suggested that the, the gains on the academic outcomes were larger in pre-K than in Head Start. But not all pre-K programs achieve these large effects, as, as you can see from the MCDL study. Many of them achieve small effects at best. Um, there's some evidence that pre-K is not always better than Head Start. So analyses of the Fragile Family Study, which were conducted in, in more typical states than Georgia or, or Tulsa or, or Oklahoma, found that for academic skills, Head Start and pre-K were not different from each other, but the Head Start and pre-K children did better than the children who did not have center care. And that for social skills, the Head Start kids actually did better than the pre-K children, and both of those groups did better than the children who had not attended center care. Okay, so the last set of evaluation studies that I want to talk to you about is studies that looked at curricula and professional development. So there have now been many curricula professional development studies because this is what the Department of Education and the institution, Institute for Educational Sciences really focused on for the years under the Bush administration and continues to have some, some major focus on. So many studies were funded, some were successful. Um, and there were, there were studies that demonstrated literacy curricula can be effective for low-income children, where looking at language-based inter interactions, where Barbara Wasson really focused on trying to get teachers to have more extended conversations and use, use um, more sophisticated words in conversations with children. <coughs> She found effect sizes of, uh, of between 0.2 and 0.35 in the evaluation of her curriculum. David Dickinson used the OWLS intervention. In one study, he had good effect sizes, where he had effect sizes of up to 0.6 and were, were able to follow the kids up into third grade and still saw associations between being exposed to the OWL curriculum and reading skills in third grade. In another study, there were not significant effects where he had a hard time getting the teachers to actually implement the curriculum. When the teachers successfully implemented, there were effects, but most teachers did not success, successfully implement. Um, there are numerous studies that have demonstrated that decoding-based um, teaching teachers to do better instruction on decoding-based activities has moderate um, effects on children's acquisition of early reading skills. Doug Powell and Karen Diamond did a very extensive evaluation demonstrating they could teach Head Start teachers to do this, and that when they did, doing it in small group as well as large group instruction, that the teachers had children who did better. Um, there are book reading interventions that have modest effect sizes. There are Huge effect sizes associated with math curricula, in part, Doug Clement says, because preschool teachers don't do math, and so it's really easy to, to make a, a difference when you implement a math curriculum because your comparison really is nothing in that case. Um, and then there are there have been curricula that focused on social skills, showing moderate to large effects in terms of children's pro-social um, pro skills, and some evidence that that might then um, translate into the, the increase in, in pro-social skills and EF kinds of skills might translate into better academic skills. So there's a whole lot of work out there about what does seem to work. So what are the challenges? How can 
what it, what do we know about trying to make this work on a large scale? And I think there's some major challenges that we face. The first one is challenges related to going to scale. And I remember one of my professors when I was in graduate school talked about the study of policy as being the study of, of trying to deal with infinite needs. Everybody is coming to the table. Everybody has needs. Everybody wants their needs dressed. And so research is just one source of information about how to deal with needs. And it may not be the one that's most relevant to the people making the decisions. The stakeholders oftentimes think, you know, really carry a lot of weight as you're making decisions about policy. Budgets also carry huge weight. So there's a lot of evidence in our 11 state pre-K evaluation that when initially implemented, the programs probably in some states were relatively good. But there was a recession in the early 2000s. The states cut back on, on the funding to the program. And there was a shift in focus from quality to access. And so programs were, were required to admit more children for less time and increase class sizes and ratios. So Tate probably took something that was relatively good and turned it into something that wasn't so good. And then um, there are issues with staff investment. As you go to scale, I think one of the big things that you run into is, especially places like Head Start, or probably even among public, public education teachers, this is the, the thing du jour. And it's going to be, you might want me to do this curriculum this year, but you're going to ask me to do something different next year. So why should I really bother to figure out how to do this really well? You're going to ask me to do all these other things, and you're just going to change it next year. So I think all of these, all three of these things make it really hard to take what we know from our research base and implement it in a large scale way. I think another challenge that we really face in terms of making these things happen in a, in a large way is the child care workforce. Right now, the program in child care in our country is not a system. And it's largely funded by parents who, in many cases, are spending as much as they possibly can on child care. But it isn't enough to allow us to pay teachers and child care providers very much. So the wage level in child care is very low, typically just barely above minimum wage. So this means that the people who go into child care, and especially the people who stay in child care, oftentimes come in with lower skill levels. And this then has consequences both in terms of keeping high quality teachers, but also in terms of probably implementing curricular, implementing the kinds of practices that we think will make a big difference. And so across a number of interventions that I've worked with, kind of like David Dickinson in his study of owls, we tried to teach, in one case it was Head Start teachers, in another case it was community child care providers, to do relatively complicated kinds of activities with children. And what we found was no difference between treatment and control. But when we looked at it carefully, when teachers implemented, there wasn't an, an effect. But it was really difficult to get the teachers to implement. And I think this is, this is going to make it difficult. As, as long as we have this cap on wages, it's going to make it very difficult for us to be able to make huge differences in terms of practices. Then another challenge we face is in, in, in using this to address um, gaps is the high level of mobility among low-income children. So you can, have, you, know, children, you can get families enrolled in a program, but there tends to be pretty high attrition. 
especially among the riskiest families. Um, so an example of this is the Educare project where there's a huge focus on continuity. They really want children to enter as baby and to stay in the same program and in fact stay with, stay with the same teacher and the same kids for five years. But what they find is that on average kids only stay one, one and a half to two years. And a lot of it has to do with the families of these, these young children who oftentimes are very, who have oftentimes have very young parents are are moving and they move someplace else and it, so they can't get their child back to the program. Um, so to me this raises this question. All of these factors raise this question. <clears throat> as we think about child care as a policy, are we really thinking that it's going to eliminate disparities? Or do we should we really rethink what we're trying to do with child care and make it a call it, you know that what we're trying to do is increase opportunity and really address issues of ensuring that children enter school ready to learn and i think that in terms of getting funding addressing eliminating gaps sounds much better you're much more likely to get a legislator excited if he thinks that investing in one year of pre-K is going to eliminate the poverty gap. But in reality, it, it seems unlike, it hopefully will reduce the poverty gap, but it's very unlikely to eliminate it. So um, in conclusion, I think there's relatively consistent, despite what my, you know, even economists now say, there's relatively consistent <coughs> research findings suggesting stronger language, academic, and social outcomes at higher quality child care programs. I think we have demonstrated that over and over again. I think the, the next wave of research needs to at least in part figure out how we can do this on a larger scale. Um, but I also worry that it's unlikely that even high quality child care programs will eliminate disparities, but they can definitely reduce them. So um, thank you, and I'd love to open it up for more questions and discussion. So can you take your own questions or I can moderate for you? Are there questions for our perfect? Hi, um, I'm a freshman undergraduate but interested in going into education policy, and I was wondering what you thought the effect of the elementary school that kids ended up going into, if that might have like affected whether or not they retained their skills. So this is a great question, and there's actually some really interesting research that was done by Katherine Magnuson that suggested that part of the, the issue with the follow-up of the Head Start Impact Study might be related to the fact that kids left Head Start with higher skill levels, mm -hmm. but they went to kindergarten and community child and community um, schools where teachers were focused on the average child or the slightly below average child. Yeah. And so the kids, the control kids in those schools showed bigger gains in elementary school than the Head Start kids did. Okay. So, I mean, it, part of it is that, you know, just like everything in our society, the schools that low-income kids go to probably on average are not as good as the kids' schools that more affluent children go to. But I think there's even this bigger issue that if what we're doing is setting up programs that raise the bar for some kids, but not all kids in the class, then the teacher in that class may be focusing on the kids down here and may not really be teaching anything new to these kids. Yeah. Thank you. And can you repeat the name of I'm Catherine Magnuson. She's at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Okay. Hey, I want to ask you about your last statement, which actually I was surprised to hear you say because I was actually going to ask you about that. And I didn't think that's where, really where you were angling that kind of temper your enthusiasm about positive findings. So uh, that was a surprise. But 
So I was going to ask you about that, but now I can't because you already, you know, you already said. <laughs> so I got another question for you, which is why, why do you temper your enthusiasm? Is it because the effect sizes overall are merely a fraction of what the real achievement gap is? Or is it because the going to scale issues are so overwhelming? Or why okay, well, at the so end did I you temper your enthusiasm about the effects of early childhood education? I mean, I think the real problem is unless we're going to give more advantaged kids bad child care, you, you know, if you give the, the less advantaged kids the same kinds of experiences the more advantaged kids are getting. This is good. I mean, you're, you're keeping the gaps from getting bigger. But if those kids already have all these other things, and you're not, you know, you're, you're just equating them on one dimension, not on all the other dimensions. And those, all those dimensions contribute, I think. So is it the modest effect sizes? I mean, no, no, it's, I mean, so this is me speaking as a mother. Yeah. You know, so, and you know, well, and, and also, like, I think some of Sean's work, Sean Reardon's work, that, you know, upper middle class families are just in, so invested in their kids from the time that kid's born. I mean, I remember I used to go visit my sister who had twins, and she wouldn't even talk to me. I mean, she was so busy talking to her kids and making sure her kids were were you know occupied and that they were learning and you know that that it I I can't see how a Head Start program could ever equate for you no know, for that that level of investment. It's, so you're essentially saying that the absolute gaps, uh, the absolute differences, there'd be absolute improvement for lower uh, income kids, but the relative gaps of differences will remain because of the extra school forces that exist for affluent kids. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so that's partly because the differences are long before three and four year olds, even three and four. So we had a session last week, and Hanal talked about the 18 month word gap in, in kids. Right. So you've got and these gaps that start off very early, and I agree with Peg that to the degree that the uh, Low income kids start closing in, the higher income fa teachers will, uh, parents will start figuring out even more ways to be able to give their children an, an advantage. But, um, Peggy, I want to ask you about universal versus targeted. Because the whole issue of um, closing the achievement gap really comes alive when you're weighing that policy decision. And California right now, it's really uh, front and center. Because we have a State Senate bill that would make uh, preschool available to all four-year-olds through the, the um, TK program. And um, Brown, who seems to be leaning much more toward targeted because it's less expensive. But there are people like Bruce Weller who will argue against Universal in part because uh, it won't close the achievement gap because, well, right, right, I right. should have raised his name. So that was no, 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 no. That's a, but, but I think the issues of I mean, so this is a, a great question. And so one of the things we did with the 11 state pre-K study was look at the natural variation in terms, in some states it was targeted, in some place, actually it was even sometimes local. In some places it was universal. And we then looked at whether there were differences in quality or child outcomes related to whether a program was targeted or universal. And we found very few differences. But in particular, once we, we controlled for, fan, you know, for entry skills. Um, but what, what was really interesting was that when we looked at classroom composition, there was actually very little difference in terms of classroom composition for targeted versus universal. Because just like public schools, you know, the, the programs that were serving the very low-income children primarily served very low-income children mm -hmm. in the universal as well as in the TARP. Yeah. Can you do me a favor and don't tell that to Governor Brown because I've been arguing for universal on the grounds that it will create more diversity. <laughs> but I think there's also... The opposite, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, 
to him. So, but I think there's also, yeah. I mean, so I heard this argument a while ago, and you know, kind of when the pre-K movement first started, and that was the argument that if you want to establish policy in this country, if you can make it an entitlement program for everybody, you're much more likely to have it continue. So kind of like kindergarten. When kindergarten became a program that all children attended, it became something we couldn't do without. You know, so to the extent that pre-K and, and, and hopefully younger services are, are universal, you're probably more likely to get a higher quality program that is more sustainable because there's going to be more grassroots support by more powerful constituents. I thought that was a pretty good argument. In the 11 state, state study, did you see that the, the places where they had universal, was there a higher quality? Did they come out looking better in terms of quality of the seat? So there was no difference. So that kind of goes against that argument. Well, no, because it, these weren't places where it would have developed far enough for that. I mean, I, this was more of an argument for how can you make, so like what I, what I do think would happen in a universal versus targeted program is in a state like North Carolina where we have had a really, really good pre-K program that is targeted. But, in, but that's in part because the governors made this one of their hallmark programs. Now we have a completely Republican governor, administration, you know, Colbert and John Stewart make fun of our state all the time. <laughs> But those, the, our pre-K program is really under threat now. And I think that if it were a universal program, it would be harder to make, it would be harder for the republic, and for people who may not like these kinds of programs to, to have that kind of impact. So I'm sorry, you've been waiting very patiently. Yeah, the argument about GAP as uh, a major, reason to do this is, I think, not a good one. Uh, if, if I, I think, I thought that the main argument for good preschool for everyone is uh, to raise learning for everybody. And theoretically, uh, this will get according to the early Head Start data, would get more people to finish high school, would keep them, you know, out of jail, would, uh, well, reduce right. these things. And so that the social externalities are very, very high. In fact, the calculations that Hecton makes and others are based mainly on externalities. So it seems that that's the argument. Uh, I mean, and who cares what the upper middle class does? Maybe Sean does, but the fact <laughs> is that they're all, they're going to do it. They're going to do it anyway. Right. So why not? And and maybe you create can and you know the schools are going to be segregated, continue to be segregated. So at least make schools for low income kids more, you know, active academic schools where the average is higher and uh, teachers are more likely if they're teaching to the average the way you claim the average is higher so everybody learns. I mean, I mean to me this is what we should be arguing for I mean I think we just need we need to really make sure all children regardless of their background can start school with good school readiness skills yeah, and then just focus on extra uh -huh. I mean that's where the action is Okay. Yeah. I, I agree with you totally, but I, I, I wonder whether that argument can be extended somewhat further. Uh, going back, go back to your slide, okay. Not only the externality, but a, a question I have in, in thinking about it is, if you got everybody school ready, and if you got everybody to graduate high school, okay, then you focused on those who are graduating high school who don't go to college uh, as your policy, 
and you get people to go to college, once they go to college, it doesn't matter where they go for, for the most part. Uh, and so that you could essentially achieve a much greater uh, level of well-being and equality by just getting everybody through high school and then take the next, next step to college. Uh, is the way I read the data, and I'd be interested uh, in, in terms of that. It's the whole adequacy versus equity yeah. argument and, in know, school funding as well. The other, it's a, go, go ahead. I, I, we can't be, I feel like we can't be apolitical about this nor can we ignore the fact that we use metrics in this society that determine how resources are allocated in terms of who ends up in power positions who ends up with resources where they can make decisions that can circle back and affect them and reproduce where they are in society. So even if we improve the well-being, academic well-being of people who are on the bottom, if it's the case that we use a test score metric to allocate resources to the universities that feed into the professional and managerial world, which generate wealth, which also generates inequality, we're keeping those people at the bottom, even if they go to college, that don't get into access. I'm not sure that's true. Things. You'll get some in there, but you won't get, you won't necessarily move the group. You'll get your, you'll, you'll have your, you'll have some representation, obviously. See, I mean, but I think my argument is actually even. It's a completely different issue. It's a, but it's about, we're talking about inequality here. We're talking about group differentiation. It's a completely different issue. But I, I mean, like my big concern I here know. is so that. What, what are we ultimately aspiring <laughs> to? We're talking about brain equality. We're not talking about brief. I hear what you say, and I guess I want to put out there that I think that I would like to see um, one of us um, be a Vygotsky or a Piaget and create a new way of thinking because we're still running under. Um, I think Ken Robinson's work is the closest I've seen changing the paradigm. We're still very, think the capital, right? Everything is, it's human capital. And so we produce children to be able to go out and either um, make money for so-and-so or not. And I think that if we looked at, because you mentioned that, you know, um, wealthier families are more invested, but I would bet to say that they have different experiences. Um, and, and those experiences affect how those parents are then going to interact with their children. And so because we're all having different experiences and we're all living in this one place together, we're not like in Europe or some other place where we can all be kind of similar, but we're all having these different experiences, we really need to, um, we really need to, to go beyond just, you know, I think the basics, you know? And so one of the things that I was thinking about was Ron Laley's work where he says that, you know, Brain development starts way, like what Dr. Seifert was saying, way before you hit four years old. And so much synaptic pruning has already occurred. And so wait until you target that, you know, that four-year-old, that five-year-old to give them something. They've already lost so much, you know. And so I think that, I think it's really about rethinking the way we think about people and the way we think about learning. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I think the Abyssinarian Project really shows. But I do want to put one more idea on the, on the table here, and that's that I think you have to be very careful how you couch your arguments because they can come back and bite you. You know, so that if we say that we're going to fund child care so that it will eliminate the, the poverty gap, and it doesn't, then, then the funding can go away. I mean, I saw this in, with Head Start. So people kept saying, Head Start will make children. Somehow they had this idea that Head Start was going to move all children to the national norm. Now, first of all, that's not even possible because not every, you know, it's a distribution and you can't move everybody up to that, you know, that level, to the same level. But because this was a promise that was made, Head Start was actually, in jeopardy for a little while before they reframe the argument. And so I just think that you have to make a really strong, way over promised set of arguments to get policy funded. But you really want to be careful as you're doing that so that you haven't set it up so that it will come back and people will say, but it didn't work, so we're going to take your funding away. We're going to end your program. I've had some experience in actually getting policy funded on the basis of 
research and for political advocacy by the groups who are determined to advocate. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying. But it strikes me in listening to your, to your overview and, and reading the excellent paper that you're giving to us um, to read that you have early emerging in the history of the research this finding that there is higher graduation rates, that there's lower retention rates, that there's lower special education rates. So you, you have that emerging as early as 76. Um, and I, I remember that, using that kind of data. And, and then you have it again emerging specifically in Head Start, and as you said, it's done by economists, so you know. Um, and yet, no one seems to have kind of gone back to that. You know, there's instead they're studying, still continuing to study test scores. Now, granted, the achievement test scores are no longer as much focused on IQ head uh, test scores, which hopefully will never come back again. But um, this this issue of children, you know, making their way through um, has not come back as something valued to be studied. And then one other thing about school readiness is that the conservative kindergarten teachers, they don't ask for the kids to come with ABC or book skills or even math skills so much. They ask for them to come with social and behavioral, social and emotional skills, self-regulation, executive function, ability to with as close as you can to the ability to follow instructions. Um, and so forth. And yet, once again, there's you know not as much of the consistent research in that kind of vein. So um, I just want to sort of put that out there and say, uh, someone who's work, right. I admire what you think. Thank you. Well, I think that I, I mean I think you're making several really good points. I mean I think first of all, test scores should never be the end point that you evaluate pre-K, any kind of early childhood program on, you know. Um, and I think that most of the studies being conducted in the last 15 years have tried to expand and EM thing, executive function. Everybody's studying executive function in some form. And effortful control. Although trying to figure out what the you know, exactly what these words mean is sometimes difficult. Um, especially in, at this point, at this age. Um, I do worry too much, I do worry a lot about this argument that what kindergarten teachers are looking for is what we should focus on because all of my work that has looked longitudinally where we have measures of children at entry to school and then we follow them into middle or high school, what we tend to find is kind of like Greg Duncan found in his evaluation, that the kinds of social skills you enter with predict are very predictive of, of the social skills that you have in middle and high school and, and beyond. But that the language skills and the kind of executive functioning skills to a lesser degree you know, and to some degree reading and math, but at that point, reading and math really are a reflection of language skills to some extent because of the early, you know, they're easily taught and they're easily, they easily go away in early childhood. Um, those things are very, very important. And I, I worry that the kindergarten teachers are being a little self-serving because their lives are much easier if children come to school with those skills. I'm not sure that those are the skills that that are the only skills that you really want to have at entry to school to school in a world that is an increasingly STEM kind of place. Yeah, I wouldn't suggest that they're, that they're, they're the only ones. I'm just intrigued by the fact that you know you have these findings, uh, the, the first set of findings that I mentioned, and then you have these these other findings by kindergarten teachers and. I probably disagree with you that it's totally self-serving. Um, you know that maybe if you and I were in a were in kindergarten school, this ratio of one one teacher to twenty-five or thirty-five year olds, 
we would want to know that we could actually reach each job. Um, um, no, I don't disagree at all. I think developing social skills is really important, and I think it's way under, as we've moved into more whole group academic kind of preschool, this is this has been one of the consequences, and I really think that's a bad thing. And I think the point that was made here, which is that we have to think differently about social skills and about emotional skills, and um, that, you know, people are coming, families are coming in, in preschool and, kin and kindergarten with very different sets of experiences, and those really shape what they want for their children. And um, we do know that parents matter most in many situations. I just want to, just, I still really feel like the thing, to me, the thing we have un undervalued too much in early childhood is language. I mean, I just think language is so important for for our world today, and that it, I'm really, I really don't think we've paid enough attention to ensuring that children have the kinds of language experiences that will help them acquire. Although Duncan's study actually showed strong predictions for math, for language, at least as far as academic. Achievement scores. Achievement, Achievement scores. test scores. Right. Predicted by math test scores. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 there was something weird about, you know, I mean, he, he did find math, but math and, and at entry to kindergarten, math and language tend to be highly, highly correlated if they're measured by the Woodcock Johnson. So the Woodcock Johnson may be almost as good a measure of language as it is. Anyway, you know, it's just hard. It's one of those things where, you know, it's hard hard to say if, if you've got high Wilcox Johnson scores, how much of that is language and how much, you know, if you've got high language scores, how much of that is whatever. But I just, again, I worry because language is very difficult to move, to change. And teaching early reading and math is very easy. And again, I feel, I feel like what people have tended to focus on are these things that are much easier to change. But those aren't the things that make a, in my mind, make a really big difference by the time kids get older. That, you know, once you, you start reading for comprehension, if you don't have a pretty broad basis of knowledge, it's very hard, even if you've got good decoding skills, to, to be a, a very effective reader. And I worry the same thing about math. Even if you can count and you can do basic, basic, basic addition, that if you don't have that broader basis, it's going to be you're, you're, it's going to be much harder for you to make progress. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.